Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 2 for History 2013, U.S. History to 1865. Today in Lecture 2, we're going to be covering early globalization, the Atlantic world. <clears throat> so again, we're, this is going to be our first lecture that we're looking at themes across time and not necessarily a specific time frame. Last week, we did. Last week, we talked about um, the specific time period of prehistory to 1492. Now we're going to start looking generally. We're going to start looking at examining those themes, looking at systems of power, what's going on, how do things change, constantly acting ourselves how and why, right? Not necessarily what and when, how and why. Generally today in this lecture, we're going to be covering the years 1492 to 1650, but don't freak out. We're not going to be like in 1493, this is what we said, right? We're looking at general themes that happened within this time period here. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at what's going on today. We only got two topics today, early expansion, sorry, early exploration in Spanish supremacy, and number two, the New World and the Colombian Exchange. You'll notice that Colombian here is spelled like Christopher Columbus and not the country of Colombia. Um, that's on purpose. A little bit of a spoiler alert there. All right, so getting ahead and getting started with topic one here. We're going to start looking at early exploration and Spanish supremacy. Now, we're going to look at this map here. Now, I'm sure you're thinking like, what the hell? Why are we looking at all of this? I can't even pronounce half of these. Um, and you're right. <laughs> you're right. These A lot of these don't exist now even today anymore, um, right? We don't have the Holy Roman Empire. Um, we don't have Castile. We don't have the Ottoman Empire, right? So why are we looking at this particular map? We're looking at this map because it gives us an idea of how many different powers, how many different people are living and existing in Europe, and how many rulers and people are fighting with each other, have competing interests, want to get the leg up, want to get above each other here, right? So we know generally that we're going to be talking about England, France, and Spain, right? When we talk about Spain, we're actually consider we're actually talking about um, this country here, Castile. Um, Spain eventually will become a unified presence here of um, Castile, Naraja, Aragon, and uh, Granada here. That eventually will be become the modern day of Spain. But at this time, it's primarily here, Castile. Um, so why? Why are these three particularly moving out? Why are they going away? Well, this is why. They've got so much to compete with here. Everyone's on top of each other. Everyone's primed for confrontations and competitions. And eventually, like we said in, in lecture one, um, exploration and then colonization will be another layer of that competition between them here. The first to kick us off, the first European nation to kick us off uh, with exploring is actually going to be Portugal. So going back to that map here for a second, Portugal is this really tiny country here, right to the west of Castile. They're going to be the first ones to actually set out and start intentionally exploring the world here. Um, so these are the maps of those first explorations here. They're all going to be led, a majority of them will be led by Prince Henry the Navigator. He is the crown prince of Portugal, and he just loves the sea. He loves exploration. And so he, because of all of his voyages and all of his, his uh, findings, he'll eventually be uh, labeled Henry the Navigator. Um, and so he, eventually he will go make these round trips, primarily to see what's going on out here in the water. Right, what's going on with Africa? What's going on here? Eventually, he will make a round trip from Portugal all the way around the bottom of Africa over to India and then back. Um, and, and during this navigation, um, he is encountering the people all along this side of Africa for the first time ever, for the first time ever. Um, and so bringing back a huge map an accurate map of what Africa looks like, um, as well as information about the cultures and the people that exist in those areas of Africa here that he had just found for the first time. Um, and then Spain will be right on the heels of Portugal. Um, Portugal will get through a few of their voyages, be like, hey, this is actually a pretty viable way of navigating, a viable way of finding goods and riches and wealth. 
and Spain will be right on their heels for it. They'll just take off right after them. Uh, we actually have here, Spain did a lot more than this, but we have four voyages here of Christopher Columbus because he is one of the reasons, better or worse, why we are here today, specifically in our geographical locations. Um, and he is going to have a series of four voyages. Um, we're not going to get into the specifics of Christopher Columbus. The uh, textbook does do that. So in your textbook reading, you'll, you'll get a little bit more specific information about him. Um, but what we want to look at here is the, the, the different routes that they're taking, right? They're following the Portuguese route here. And eventually they're saying, all right, time to do it. We're going to go into no man's land. They thought that they would end up in India, hence, you know, why we refer to Native Americans in North America as Indians. Um, but we we don't know. We don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know exactly where we'll end up. Um, and so it is kind of lucky that he stumbles upon these islands. Uh, he'll make the first route here and then eventually turn back and go back to Spain. The second, the you'll see he's, he kind of goes a different route every time. He's going deeper and deeper down, right? They don't think necessarily about going up, right? They think that once they realize that this is not India, which is pretty early on, um, whenever they don't find any Indian goods, um, they know that these are a set of islands here. They try to go past it. They think it's a set of islands in the middle between them and Spain. Uh, I'm sorry, between them and India. So they go, they run into Central America here. Then they're like, oh, there's actually more land here. Let's figure this out. And so that final voyage is like, okay, we need to go under that land that we encountered. And then they just encounter more land. And so pretty pretty quickly, pretty early on, they had this understanding that there's a huge land mass in between them and India. But they really don't know how huge this land mass is. And they'll find eventually. Spain is going to be the first ones to set up permanent colonies in these areas. And from those permanent colonies, they'll begin doing land uh, explorations. And they'll go all over into the United present-day United States, all over Mexico, and even into South America. That, that, that will take them a lot longer um, because of the environment in South America. And so what we get is from 1492, when Christopher Columbus has first contact with the, the people uh, on the islands in, in the Caribbean, all the way through 1605, we're still exploring this land. We're still trying to figure out how to get to the other side of this land. It takes forever because that is how huge the land masses of North and South America are. And so Spain and the other European countries it's kind of not worth it for them, except for the fact of all the foreign goods, specifically the gold and the silver that they find here, right? The things that keep them coming back. It's also beneficial to them because they find a race of people that they are able to use. Um, and that's not me editorializing, that's direct quotes from Columbus's diaries and, and sailors from him, his, um, his voyages that they don't see these people as real people. They see them as people that they are able to control, people that they are able to make subservient to them. And so these are the people that are actually doing the hard work throughout all of this time. And eventually we get um, religious involvement as well here um, that, that also comes over to uh, mission uh, and, and evangelize to the Native American people here. So what does this mean for Spain? Well, Spain has a pretty big majority monopoly on the new world for a long time, for several years. They are the only ones worried about working on trying to get anything out of this new world. Remember our uh, first um, set of English and French sailors, colonizers, are not gonna arrive until the later mid to late 1600s. So up until the early 1600s, Spain has free reign over all of this territory. Um, they're just going everywhere. They're looking at everything, they're finding everything, they're recording everything and they're bringing it back to Europe. Which is gonna, it's just gonna intrigue those other people, right? 
there's a meme here about that Spanish uh, arrival in the new world here with Cortez saying, do you know who just Jesus Christ asked X who Cortez? And there seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere, which is pretty accurate, right? Not necessarily for that reason, but that's how the, 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 um, the, the, treatment of these people come from is that they are not seen as people of intelligence i went back to europe for a second so spain has this monopoly going on but it also has a near constant war uh with england um it's not a good time for england and spain here so between the 14 and 1500s there's a huge amount of stuff going on uh, in England, we have religious upheaval and change. This is the time of the Protestant Revolution, which is, I'm sorry, the Protestant Reformation, which is going to change across Europe the way that governments are run, the way that monarchies are uh, selected and entrusted, and the way that all of the society, the culture it is run and done. Um, we're going to have more and more people here. There's going to be more movement of people between countries and within the countries, which means that we're going to have a lack of space and opportunity for these people. So they're going to want to start looking elsewhere. They're going to go out somewhere else to find what they can't find and get from themselves in, in their European uh, uh, countries and areas. Um, finally, the people in England are going to have jealousy of Spain. They're going to have a huge rivalry going on during these times. And that's a historic, you know, going on even prior to the 1400s. Um, they're just going to have this lot of back and forth, that one-upmanship, that competition that we talked about in lecture one is going to make them want to go ahead and, and try to get the jump on Spain, especially once Spain is taking over and having all of the success in the new world here. They're going to be see that and be jealous of that. Spain, on the other hand, is going to have these other problems coming in. Um, they're going to have pressure from the Ottoman Empire, which is going to be increasing that influx of, of Islam in their area. Um, which means that they're going to have a lot of pushback between um, the, the Catholic Spain and Islamic Ottoman Empire. Um, they're both going to be fighting for the same territories and the same people. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, we're going to get this increased wealth and power from the colonies in Spain that is going to make them want to continue doing that and to continue um, showing off to people, but they want to protect their sources, right? They want to say, oh, look at all this gold, look at all this, these goods that I have, but I'm not going to tell you where, where I got it from. Don't go looking over the Atlantic Ocean, right? Um, and then eventually they'll have dwindling naval superiority. Spain had been the primary, the biggest navy uh, in Europe for a long time. Um, and eventually England is going to start catching up to them. And England is going to have their own kind of uh, robust navy that's going to really challenge Spanish authority here. So as we have things going on in, in Europe, we have these other things taking our attention in the new world. Uh, and eventually that's going to lead to everybody getting into the new world, right? Primarily here for our purposes, the Dutch, English, and French are gonna join Spain here um, and, and try to make their own foothold in these areas and make it just as successful, profitable as Spain has been doing. Now, this isn't an exclusive list. This is just the list that we're looking at for our purposes in uh, early American history. But we do have other countries. Scotland tries to set up a colony. Uh, Portugal will set up several successful colonies in South America. Um, and we have these other areas, these other countries that are also trying to do the same thing, but they don't settle in the same places that we're looking at that becomes the eventual United States of America. Um, and so you can see Spain quickly loses that, that authority that, that they have. And what eventually happens with all the European settlements here is that we have this back and forth going on. We call it the Columbian exchange after Christopher Columbus because he's kind of our guy that kicks us off in the new world here. And we have things being brought over from the old world, from Europe into the new world, the Americas, and then things from the new world, the Americas, being brought back to the old world, to Europe. Some of them are good. Some of them are very not so good. There's a lot of disease that comes over from Europe into America. Um, there are studies that the reason that Europe has so many sicknesses is because of the way that Europe interacted with their farm animals and raises those animals. 
when you are in close proximity to animals, you are more likely to pick up sicknesses from them, right? Um, so you can even look back at um, recent examples of such as a swine flu, things like that, that because of the way that Europe developed and developed their agriculture, the, the proximity to those animals is going to increase their likelihood of developing sicknesses. Now, the upside of that is that humans can build immunity to it. So Europe, after years of living with their animals, has that immunity to those sicknesses that come about. In North and South America, even in the places that we have settled civilizations, we do not have the keeping of animals in the same way that Europe does. There is a distance between the humans and the animals in the, in the Americas. And the, what goes along with that is that we do not have that immunity. We do not have that resistance built up in the American cultures. So when diseases are brought over from Europe, it wipes out hundreds, thousands, millions of inhabitants in the Americas during this time because they have no buildup to it. Right, they have nothing to do with it, to to prevent themselves from getting sick. Um, what we additionally have here is a transplant of goods and grains and animals that existed at this time only in the old world in Europe, and bring them over to the new world, which causes environmental change. And we have the opposite happening. We have things that are only in the old world or in the new world brought over to the old world. A prime example of this is potatoes. We might only we might associate now Ireland with potatoes. That's not a native crop to Ireland. That's brought over from South America and it takes off there because it works well with their climate. So this exchange happens back and forth um, and it truly alters the way that the rest of development, the rest of society will develop as we go along through the rest of this semester. With that, this is going to be the end of lecture two. If you have any questions about this lecture or if you want to see any of the images or maps that I used more up close, please put a message in the question form or send me an email. Otherwise, that's the end of lecture two, and I'll see you guys back here for lecture three.